I'm going to start and give a brief, as uh, brief as I can, overview of, in, in part, the book as a project, and then the first uh, three chapters will give you a little bit of, of, of the con stuff, but we're going to hope to focus more on what Claire will have to say, which is about the operation of the uh, European Court of Justice, uh, Court of Human Rights and the European Convention on Human Rights. I just want to say that, from my point of view anyway, this evening is about Claire, not really about me. <laughs> I would not have written this book uh, without Claire's collaboration. Uh, I met her in her first year uh, JD, as JD, and we've worked together ever since. And uh, uh, under no circumstances would I have uh, touched this, uh, <laughs> touched this project had she, had she not been available and fully committed. And she did so. We actually started the book when she began the PhD program. She was able to write the book with me uh, and uh, fulfill all the other requirements of the PhD at the same time, which, uh, which is uh, quite impressive. So the, the, the project is about, uh, in, in part, the thing that you'll probably care most about, it's about the European Convention on Human Rights as a multi-level, tr transnational uh, system of constitutional justice. And the court, just for those of you who don't know, is by far the most active court in the world, has the biggest docket, produces the most more decisions than any other court in the world, and it's the single most important human rights jurisdiction at either domestic or the international level. It is the oracular court uh, making the most law, generating the most normativity in human rights uh, in the world, and is by far the most influential court, and not just in Europe. So for instance, the American, Inter-American Court, African Courts, UN Human Rights Committee, Canadian, Canada, Taiwan, Constitutional Court, never make a move without discussing in full what the European Court of Human Rights uh, does. Now, uh, so this project is partly uh, uh, about explaining why it is that all of this has happened, uh, and, but in particular, why this particular beast, we call the European Convention on Human Rights, as an international human rights regime, meets the criteria, uh, criteria, the criteria of what I call constitutional or cosmopolitan legal order, uh, uh, which is derived from my uh, my reading uh, readings in the last ten years on, on Kant. And I'm just going to read from the first sentence of the book, which is the definition of what a cosmopolitan legal order is, and what you should what you should notice is how surprising such a legal order has ever emerged in the world. So a cosmopolitan legal order is a multi-level, transnational legal system in which one, justiciable rights are held by all individuals. Two, all public officials bear the obligation to fulfill the fundamental rights of every person that comes uh, within their jurisdiction without respect to nationality or citizenship. And three, both domestic and transnational judges supervise how officials do, do so. Now in Europe, an order, an order, uh, uh, order that uh, emerged, a cosmopolitan legal order that, con that conforms to those to those criteria, and emerged as a product of the combined effects of two things. The first is Protocol Number Eleven, which is a treaty supplement, a, a, su a supplementary treaty provision uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the European Convention on Human Rights uh, that uh, establishes the right of individual petition directly to the European. <laughs> Court of Human Rights upon the exhaustion of local remedies. So if you lose all the way through and you have a legitimate and meaningful right to claim, you can go to, you can go to Strasbourg, uh, where, where the court. And the second, the second thing that transformed uh, this this convention is the incorporation of uh, the convention directly into domestic law as directly judicially enforceable by judge, by ordinary judges in the system, not just by constitutional judges. So the convention uh, has been incorporated in all but. Uh, two states, really, in the UK, being one of them, as not only it's really enforceable against statutes. Uh, judges have the power uh, to invalidate statutes that violate the convention. So the convention is, is in many places, the real constitution, including in, for most judges, including in places like France, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, uh, Switzerland. Uh, in other places, it supplements the Constitution. The constitutional judges use it to, to help them uh, gain authority within the system. Uh, and uh, in, and in still others, in most, I would say, and we'll come back to that later, it's uh, provoked a deep transformation of the very structure of law, law and politics across 
uh, Europe. So the question is, why did this happen? And, and uh, I have, I shouldn't say I, we have developed a Kantian framework to help us uh, explain uh, why this has happened. And I just want to very, very briefly touch on uh, the, the Kantian f features of uh, 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 theoretical features that have helped helped us uh, organize this book. So chapter one, what, what, this happens in the first few chapters. And chapter one's point of departure is a famous essay that Kant wrote in 1795 called uh, uh, "Perpetual Peace," where Kant famously laid down a blueprint for how states could avoid uh, the chronic reproduction of war. How would they? How could they? How could they live in perpetual peace? And also achieve a right, what he called a rightful condition, we some call that justice, uh, among themselves, peacefully, live in, a, live in perpetual peace. And he famously argued that if states met three conditions, these three conditions or factors would combine in such a way that states would not go to war with each other. States who shared these, these, uh, 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 who, who, uh, shared these, uh, these uh, factors or, with these factors would work, would not go to war with each other. And the three factors are the, relate to the organization of the state. That's the first one. They're Republican states. They're states that are, we now, we now strip that, uh, that variable as more or less liberal democracies with more or less market freedoms and with courts that recognize, courts that are effective enough to, to enforce rights or, uh, or help to perfect over time something like the rule of law. And the second uh, variable is, is uh, are interactions between such Republican states. The more they interact within, intensively within a federation or a league of states, uh, as coordinative devices or other, or as normative, uh, as sites of normative production, the, also the more likely that they will uh, not go to with each other. And the third has to do with the structure of norms that governs these interactions, which Kant called, famously called hospitality, uh, where you emphasize the, the uh, interactions of particular transnational economic actors with one another, with engaging in commerce across borders and so on. But also, it, it, he emphasized in, in, in uh, various writings that this could include all of what we now call uh, civil and political uh, rights. And even more interestingly, he developed, uh, he developed or elaborated the mechanisms through which each of these factors individually would contribute to peace and why, if they were brought together, uh, that would close down possibilities for war. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these mechanisms, but I will say that political scientists, of which I am one, uh, have ran with this uh, starting in the 1980s. They started uh, operationalizing these variables and then looking to see if states that met these conditions, or the more states met these conditions, the less they would go to war with each other. And in my opinion, you know, it's not, it's not everybody would share this, but I think it's the, by far, but there's not even, wow, to say, there's not even any competition. Political scientists have not produced a lot of really earth-breaking findings. I would say, I'm talking about my own discipline. But the most important one is that states that meet these criteria do not go to war with each other. It's called the Kantian peace or the liberal peace. There are no exceptions. Uh, so this was quite extraordinary if you know anything about political science, even though we expect war uh, in international relations. Uh, that's my first field of international relations. We're taught from the very beginning that war is a chronic state of affairs because there's no sovereign and so on. And it doesn't matter how states are organized. And international law doesn't matter. And federations don't matter. Organizations don't matter. That dominates the field even today. And Kant said all of those things matter, and he is right. In my view. So, why is this, what does this got to do with this project? Well, in fact, if you read Perpetual Peace, it's Kant's, uh, Kant's priority is not just absence of war between, between states, although that's important, uh, but it was the creation of a rightful condition, a, a system uh, at the cosmopolitan or the constitutional, international constitutional level that would guarantee the external freedom of all individuals and people in a common system uh, based, on, uh, based on justice as he understood it. Uh, and that's been ignored entirely. So what I wanted to do when I originally was war I meant, so I, when I originally started this project was to, was to ask that, ask about that question, focus our attention on what Kant emphasized, but, but political scientists have not. 
So that's chapter one. Chapter two engages Kantian constitutional theory, most of which is elaborated in the, in the doctrine of public right of the metaphysics and morals. And this is a very, very complicated topic. This is the hardest, I think, the hardest chapter to read. It tries to, it tries to derive the basic institutional features that would allow people to maximize their capacity at the domestic level to achieve a rightful condition. Kant, again, famously argued that all individuals, all public officials in all states uh, have a moral obligation. Uh, a categorical moral obligation to work to achieve a rightful condition, that is constitutional justice, if you will, uh, uh, and but then didn't, but then didn't really provide many institutional details of how of what such a system would look like. So one uh, important part of the project, uh, and it's in chapter two, uh, is to answer the question: What kind of a legal system would actually allow us to opt to maximize our capacity to achieve this this condition? What would the structural features of this legal system look like? And the model that develops from it's a model of trusteeship. The court says trustees. The model that develops looks basically like this, although I'm simplifying. Is that people place their freedom in the form of a charter of rights, uh, in trust, constitutional trust. Rights are positive requirements of legality. That is, a no act of public authority is lawful or legitimate if it does not conform uh, to a charter of rights. Now, that implies that charters of rights also authorize also authorize a government to do things. And their primary task in Kantian theory is to produce the conditions that will allow people to live with one another uh, in what you would call a free, as free and equal juridical persons in, a, in, a, a, in, in external freedom. It just means they can live peacefully together because if everybody exercised their freedom to the max, you know, we'd have something like a jungle and something like a war. So the gov what government's job is to find ways to balance these various freedoms with our need to have the rules that will allow us to productively live together in a, in a just system. He calls that the rightful condition. So rights authorize governments to do things, but it also places them under an obligation, uh, we argue, and those obligations are pretty clear that they have to provide uh, reasons, justifications for any act or state measure that would limit the scope uh, of, of a right. Most rights in the modern world are what we call qualified. They're not absolute. An absolute right, by definition, is a right that for which there is no just state justification possible uh, for, for the limitation of the scope. And we famously have things like dignity and right to be free from torture, the right, right to be free from state sponsored killing. Uh, there are a handful of, of rights, in ter modern charges of rights, that are conceived in absolute terms. They neatly map onto Kant's ideas about uh, the absolute nature of certain rights. On the other hand, most rights are what we call qualified rights. This is somewhat of America, somewhat of an exception. But everybody else in the room that goes to another place knows perfectly well what a qualified right is. It's a right that's announced and then immediately followed by a limitation clause that says that this right can be uh, limited, its enjoyment can be limited by government officials for some sufficiently important public purpose. Now, in Kant, that means it can only be limited for one public purpose, which is to create a rightful condition, to create the conditions under which we have people can live in their externally free. So, uh, if that's also, if that's also, then it begs the question of who's to enforce these rights or who's to supervise the work of these officials whose task is to create this rightful condition uh, and to assess the justifications. And of course, then we all know, because we're in the law school, that we need a constitutional court, we need a supreme constitutional court, we need an unilateral uh, lawmaker in Kantian terms whose mission, whose sacred mission, is to evaluate the justifications given by government to limit the scope of rights in terms of in terms of the doctrines of public right, in terms of, of, of creating uh, a, uh, a, right, a rightful condition. And this also implies that individuals, in addition to the rights that they, they possess, that they also have extensive a sense of standing and they have a right, a positive right, to, uh, to justification from government. So a big, part of, a big part of Kantian theory is the idea that all individuals uh, possess this almost natural and inalienable right to demand of government officials who would limit their freedom a, a, a justification. And for that to be effective, we need to have some kind of institution that, uh, or, that uh, evaluates those justifications in terms of Kantian criteria for, for legality, which are enshrined in the charter of rights. 
So the basic model is that we have freedom has been placed in trust, the Constitution moves forward, uh, government, government's task is to create, to create the rules that will, will help to establish or perfect a rightful condition. The, the court is a kind of trustee of the system or a caretaker of the system whose primary job is to monitor and evaluate what all other public officials do, uh, and so on. So that's the domestic model that produced in Chapter 2. And in Chapter 3, uh, this model is applied then uh, with some help from Kant again, because Kant has some, some very strong statements about how this should work, uh, applied to what an international regime would look like. So Kant imagined, and all of, what's really amazing about all this one of the reasons that I uh, have slowly become much more Kantian is that Kant wrote all this before there were rights, justiciable rights, or judicial review, or constitutions in the sense that, that we know about now. This is, uh, there weren't any systems in the world that looked like the Kantian system that he imagined, and there were certainly no international systems that looked like. We'd have to wait till after World War II for those to, to, to appear. So when he applies this to when, he, to, when he starts to imagine what this would look like at the international level, he stresses a couple of obvious points. Uh, it's obvious after you've read the, 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 the perpetual peace and metaphysics and morals, that you have to have, uh, the system has to, has, to, has to have parallel each other, or mirror each other, as opposed to the domestic level and transnational level. So there's got to be a transnational unilateral trustee, and there has to be a domestic one as well. One of the features that uh, Kant emphasizes is that the, the federation at the international level, the kind of human rights regime, if you will, uh, should not be given the authority of the court. However powerful this trustee in court is, should not be given the authority uh, to exercise sovereignty, the way he thought about that, direct coercive authority within the domestic legal order. So it was very important for him he thought as a socializing device and as a way of getting this system started for that court to be limited to a kind of oracular function. That is, we can render justice, we can give reasons for why it is the state has violated the, the rights of, say, an individual, but we don't have the authority say, to invalidate a statute or, a, or an administrative decree or any other public act within the domestic order. So the big difference between the European Court of Human Rights, which is now recognized as a constitutional court, by the way, and in, in a traditional domestic court, as a traditional domestic constitutional court has the power to invalidate or quash uh, you know, any, any, any uh, act of public authority. Whereas the court doesn't. All it can do is declare a violation and give reasons. So it's the authoritative interpreter of the European Convention. And remember, anybody can come to it. It gets 65,000 applications a year. It produces an average of 1,500 fully reasoned decisions in the merits. This is an extraordinary, extraordinary court. Uh, our friend Clark can tell us why it's overwhelmed and, and so on. <laughs> but the, the, the second structural feature, I'm going to skip a lot because I, I just talked more than I wanted to. Uh, the, first, the first is this, this question of sovereignty. The second one, uh, it, it's actually a direct, uh, a direct uh, segue into, into what Claire might have to say. Uh, and the second feature, which is a little complicated to explain, but I'll, I'll try to do it as simple as I can. And that's that the, the, uh, this protocol number 11, which allows individuals to go to the court directly. States can't block the suit against them. States agreed to do this. So we don't, it's not, we're not in a world where the, the court has effected a coup d'etat or something, uh, as in Israel. But uh, this is a system in which, a system in which uh, states succeeded to this. Uh, and the second issue is the corporation issue means that they're, they're triggered this deep transformation. Because in most European states, there was either no Bill of Rights that was enforceable, or there was a prohibition uh, of judicial review, at least for the ordinary court. So the constitutional courts had monopolies uh, on the authority to evaluate, say, statutes against any, any legal criteria, including rights. What incorporation does, by definition, is it, it, then, it then diffuses the power of judicial review, including over statutes, to every judge. And in Europe, many systems, most systems on the continent, have multiple legal systems. So Germany famously has six, France has three, Belgium has two, and we can go on and on. They have specialized administrative courts, constitutional courts, and social security courts, labor courts, and so on. All of these judges now have this authority that we usually associate in the continental separation of powers with the constitutional court. Uh, and so they all become constitutional judges. It undermines the, it undermines the monopoly of, of constitutional judges. 
uh, on questions of uh, legal validity and questions of conflicts between, between norms uh, and conflicts between jurisdictions. And it destroys parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, uh, destroys it utterly. So what this has created is what, what I call a kind of constitutional pluralism. You see it in two ways, in my last two senses. At the international level, if you think of the regime as a whole, we see that we have multiple high courts that operate as trustees interacting with one another with limited resources on the part of the court, so I can talk about to actually control what they're doing. So everybody's enforcing the convention. The convention is the real constitution in many, many places because it's directly enforceable by judges, all judges, whereas where you have a constitutional court, it's not directly enforceable in quite the same way. And the second thing is that there's a lot of this fragmented authority happening within the state. Why? Because we have what we call source pluralism. We have multiple charters of rights. We have both the convention and the national, national charter of rights. Lawyers have a choice of which charter of rights to plead before which judge, and you have jurisdictional pluralism, and then you have multiple courts, high courts, who cannot control one another, especially under the convention, who are interpreting and applying authoritatively, at least for the domestic legal system, the convention. This means it's torn apart systems. You cannot talk about systems in the way that you used to. It's kind of centralized sovereignty. There are two kinds of centralized sovereignty systems in Europe, around the world. There's a legislative sovereignty, and there's a constitutional court sovereignty. By sovereignty, I just mean that there's a, there's a final, ultimate final word that, you, that, that can settle conflicts between norms and conflicts between jurisdictions. Now, you don't have that. In other words, France has three constitutional courts. Defend that to the death. Italy has three. Uh, Belgium has two. Uh, and uh, and that's an extraordinary thing. So you have this kind of uh, unbundling of, but that's exactly what you would want because remember the definition of the cosmopolitan legal order is that all individuals complete rights. Every judge, every public official is under the obligation to fulfill those rights, and every judge must have the power to enforce those. That's not too surprising for an American who thinks of you know where judicial review is diffused to all judges. Uh, but um, but it is a it is a trans it's transformative in systems that were based on uh, parliamentary sovereignty. Great, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, one might be wondering after that introduction how this actually works uh, in practice and the ways in which the European Court of Human Rights has situated itself in this extraordinary position within the European legal order. Uh, this is by no means a foregone conclusion when it was created. Uh, after the Second World War. And so I want to talk a little bit about both the structural, sort of procedural aspects of the European Court of Human Rights and how it's situated within the European legal order, and also how some of the court's doctrines have developed to both expand beyond uh, what we call rights minimalism or sort of a, a floor of uh, human rights protection to something that is much more robust across Europe, as that has, as Alex said, diffused through national legal systems by interpretation and enforcement at the domestic level. Um, and then uh, to conclude, our final chapter looks at how this has not only touched European countries, but has really expanded beyond the borders of Europe uh, and covered many, many situations, which yet we would not necessarily think of as being under the jurisdiction of human rights. Uh, so to start with, um, Alex said that the European Court of Human Rights is a constitutional court. Uh, this is, I think, an uncontroversial statement to us, but maybe a controversial statement to some. And um, I want to talk about a little bit about what that actually means. Um, so over the course of the ECHR's history, it has really transformed from an external human rights body that has issued a relatively small number of cases, some of them very important in their uh, context, but that doesn't have this uh, broad oracular function, function, this lawmaking function that, that Alec described. So one of the things that the ECHR has done to transform itself from this external international type human rights body into something that has this incredibly powerful role that has created this cosmopolitan legal order is through uh, something which Alex already mentioned, which is Protocol 11. And it's what makes this so incredible is that prior 
to entry into force of protocol, and this was in the late 90s, the uh, court got cases through a commission system, sort of a filtering system. Um, and people were not able, individuals were, did not have access directly to the court. And when that changes, and people, they still have to go through domestic legal systems, but when individuals can trigger the human rights court directly, the court's caseload absolutely exploded, really at a, an astronomical level. And this also coincided with the entry into the convention system of Central and Eastern European countries at the fall of the Soviet Union. And what this meant was that not only was there a massive increase in the number of cases that could come before the court, but also the jurisdiction of the court was enormous. At over 400 million people under this jurisdiction, and so it would, it would seem plausible, and it did indeed seem for a time like the court would buckle under the weight of these backlogs over 100,000 cases in backlog, and I mean, really serious, serious challenges. And uh, what it did instead was to reinvent its role as this constitutional court, as having this oracular lawmaking fun uh, function, rather than trying to do individual justice of this person brings a claim before the court, and their uh, remedy is some form of damages. That still exists, of course, but that's not the main for purpose and function of the court today. Um, and there are a couple of reasons why that transformation has been possible. One is within the internal procedures of the court itself. And we go into detail in the chapter about how the ECHR has transformed its internal functioning to serve this larger uh, justice function. And one of the key ways has been through what are called pilot judgments, which is essentially a, it's been um, a, akin to a class action, but it's quite different in the sense that it, essentially the court will identify a particular case in, in areas where there's been a, a deep structural problem. So this often happens in countries where the problem, and this is absolutely essential to the, the Kantian model, where the, the domestic legal order has not been able to recognize individuals' rights within their court system because of some structural deficiency. Often this is uh, delay or lack of enforcement or other types of problems. And there the ECHR has been able to pick an individual case and use that as a model through which it can then say to the domestic legal order, this is how you have to change. This is how you have to restructure at the national level. Something the ECHR cannot do directly, as Alex said, but which it can tell to the domestic legal order, if you don't make these changes, there are 5,000 cases <laughs> pending before us that we will say the same thing over and over again. And in fact, with some, this has been a complex issue, especially um, if anyone knows about the UK uh, story involving uh, prisoners' voting rights. But overall, this has been a very effective uh, transformation. Another thing that the ECHR has done is to articulate what it calls general measures. And this is actually something where the, the court has, through its own uh, jurisprudence and its own case law, articulated a vast expansion of the scope of its, reme of its remedies. So in the convention itself, the court has one essential remedy, and that is to uh, require damages. Uh, this is the sort of general way in which it operated. However, through its own transformation of its role, it has begun to say, rather than just, though you need to pay compensation to this individual who's been wronged, rather, here are the ways in which the domestic legal order needs to change in order to become consistent with the convention. And that's a really big difference. It's one thing to say, this individual's human rights have been violated in a particular case, and therefore some compensation is owed. But you can, can carry on as you were to say, this is actually a major transformation that needs to be implemented at the domestic level. And what's extraordinary is the extent to which there has been actual compliance, even on these general measures. And, um, what that means is that the court has been able to take on a much more of a monitoring function 
of how domestic legal orders are compliant with the convention in a way that looks very much like the story that Alec was just telling about the sort of two-tiered system in which every actor, every state actor within the system is obliged to comply with, with individual rights. Uh, so then uh, that's the sort of structural story. So the doctrinal story is one that goes from, okay, so when the member states were agreeing to the convention at the beginning, there was not a lot of agreement about the content or the substance of the rights that would be uh, enforced through the convention. Uh, so it would be understandable and in fact expected that as an international convention, this would mean that the rights would be the sort of minimal agreed upon level of rights among the member states, a relatively thin protection. But in fact, over time, the ECHR has developed doctrines which have allowed it to move beyond this sort of rights minimalism model into something that's much more robust and actually has transformed even among countries that you might think of as having relatively good records on rights to change things like um, LGBT rights, inclusion of Roma people in the rights protecting system and the like. And the way that they've done that primarily has been twofold. So one, which Alec also started to mention before, is through the use of proportionality analysis. This is the way in which courts assess claims and balance claims against state interests when it's qualified rights, this is the, there's the right, and then there's the limitations that the state is allowed to use. The ECHR has been able to require that every state use that type of balancing, essentially require uh, through its doctrine, um, as a way to ensure that when this, that the state, and again, this is the idea that the rights also authorize state action, that when the states act, it is only insofar as, as it is justified under the right. And that's absolutely essential. And not only that the ECHR has done it, but also that it has now re re essentially required that courts within member states also use proportionality analysis as their mode of balancing rights against uh, the state interest rather than some more deferential standard which was uh, available in some countries like the UK, like a reasonableness standard rather than a necessity standard. Uh, and the second way in which the court has been able to move the, uh, the floor of rights over time is through the use of the margin of appreciation. Now this might sound strange to anyone who's heard of the margin of appreciation because it is often couched or thought of as a deference doctrine. And so how could the deference doctrine be the thing that moves rights forward? But the way that it works is that what the ECHR does is that it's very aware of the way in which national legal orders address a particular claim or a particular right and, and look to the member states to see, okay, is there a wide variation on how this issue is approached at the member state level? There, there might be a wider zone of discretion available to member states. But as it becomes clear over time that particular uh, arguments in favor of restricting a right are no longer available at the national level, the ECHR will, will see this as a change in consensus, in European consensus, and will narrow the margin of appreciation. I'll essentially then being used not as the driver of the content of rights, but as the court that brings outliers into line, into compliance with the way the rest of the European system is operating. So those are the two sort of primary ways in which the ECHR has been able to essentially, and not, not necessarily in the Kantian terms, but essentially create this cosmopolitan legal order that Alec was talking about at the beginning. And I'll just uh, end by briefly talking about the last chapter, which has two components. The first addresses the very few absolute rights, that is to say those rights for which there is not a Kantian congruent justification. Um, and there the ECHR has, again, not shied away from being extraordinarily powerful in saying to member states, even in issues that involve uh, very poor sovereign things like immigration and war, that there are certain activities which are simply not available to member states. And this includes things like uh, torture. 
And then finally, that through this articulation that all actors within the state must be responsible to or must take rights into account, this has expanded the scope of the ECHR's uh, jurisdiction from those things which occur on European soil to those things for which European actors are responsible. And this has expanded well beyond the scope that the US Supreme Court, for instance, has uh, said in its uh, rights analysis to essentially, although there are some exceptions, but essentially any situation in which uh, an actor, public actor, whether it's a soldier or a police officer or whatever, uh, of a European state is involved or responsible to some extent. Effective control. Exercises effective control, exactly, um, of the situation. And that could be in the middle of a war zone. Uh, it doesn't have to be within Europe, on European soil. And it can also mean, for instance, sending, extraditing or deporting someone to a country that does, is not compliant with uh, the prohibition on torture. So this has been a vast expansion of the cosmopolitan legal order. And uh, those are just the sort of general steps in the book, we go into much more detail about various uh, specific rights and the ways in which things have been uh, <clears throat> addressed at various levels. What's important, I think, to note about the way that we approach this, which is not the way that most of the literature in this area approaches it, is that you have to look both at what Strasbourg is doing and at what the member states are doing. You cannot understand the power of Strasbourg without understanding the way it's been implemented and understood at the member state level. And you cannot understand the transformations on rights and judicial review at the member state level without understanding the developments at the supranational level. Um, and with that, I will open it up to questions. <laughs>